Good to see you. Good to be in the Lord's house again. Got old brother Greg Fallbush from up in Nashville, Tennessee, be preaching for us tonight. We got Stephanie and Jeff singing. We're happy in the Lord. Had a good day today. We're ready for page 110, Heaven's Jubilee. Look. Sing it right now. Oh, some glad morning we shall see Jesus in for an offering we ask that you give as God's blessed you uh, if he if he has given you plenty give plenty if you need some we'll try to help you out we'll ha ask sister Stephanie to play and and again uh, we're one of the seven percent of the churches in the United States which is a pretty neat thing that uh, our folks have been giving and um, and things have been taken care of we're proud of that and we're thanking God I think maybe Jeff and Stephanie will sing for us for the offering. You give as God's blessed you. There's a number of ways to give. You can give online. You can send a check. Um, we'll send somebody by the house if you need us to pick it up. Thank God. Hey, listen, help us to pray for Sister Ann Shelton. She's a sweet friend, a sweet friend and a, and a faithful servant of God. And so remember Sister Ann. You 
say I'm not able, I'm too young or I'm too old. I can't sing or teach, and no title do I hold. Lord, what can I do? For I want to do my part, and I want to help the hurting with all of my heart. I can pray until the walls come down. Till there's healing on 
Amen. Well, it's good to have Brother Greg Fallbush with us. As you know, he taught here many years at our school. Uh, when I actually worked at the school, it was me, Mr. Craddock, and Greg Fallbush. We were the only men, the only men at the school. Uh, but uh, he, he helped build our program here at the school. He uh, attended church here for many years, went to New Hope Friel Baptist Church, and uh, did a great job there. And God called uh, he and Angela and the family up to Nashville, Tennessee, to Welch College. He's an administrator up there. He uh, heads over our athletics and head basketball coach, does many, many things uh, there and is doing a great job. And now he's pastoring actually my in-laws church at uh, Cane Ridge Free Old Baptist Church right outside of Nashville, doing a great job there. So we're excited to have him here tonight. I know you are. I've heard a lot of people uh, said they're just wanting to come back to church tonight so they could hear him, but you have to watch through the live stream. So give him a hand through the live stream as Brother Greg Falbush comes to preach for us this evening. In Matthew chapter 6 is where we'll be. I'm glad to see everybody that still loved me showed back up tonight. Yes, sir. So, yep, three of you. That's good. So, but it is good. I'm, I'm just excited to get to preach inside. Uh, since early March, we've been preaching outside. And in Tennessee, it's either windy, cold, or really hot. And it changes from week to week. So, we're just excited to be back inside today as we'll mentioned a minute ago, when we left to go to Tennessee, we were planning on going up there to work at the college and just uh, relax a little bit, but God had different things and has called us into pastoring again, and we love the church that we're at, love the people, and we uh, started pastoring in September, and uh, in January, we gave the vision for the church for the year, and um, part of that vision was to focus on the things that we need to be doing better as Christians. And one of that has been prayer. So we've been preaching on prayer, and I have been doing a series on Matthew chapter 6, a, about a nine-week series. So I've got nine points tonight. No, we didn't. We, we, we put it down to four or five points for you tonight, but we're going to look at Matthew chapter 6. In verse 9, where we'll go through 9 through 13. So Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13. Here's what the scripture says. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation... But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Father, we love you tonight. And we, uh, Lord, we ask you that you um, send your Holy Spirit among us tonight. We invite you here, Lord. We, yeah. we need you. Lord, we know that this is an unusual time on how that we're doing church services, Lord. But you do amazing things through unusual times. And Lord, we ask you, Father, that we use the words that's in the Scripture tonight to help us become more in your image. We give you all the, the praise tonight. Lord, we can't handle it and we don't deserve it. So we give it all to you. And it's your holy name we pray. Amen. Yeah. As I read the Scripture here out of Matthew chapter 6... Probably most everyone at home and, and the ones that's here could quote this scripture. It's known as the Lord's Prayer. It is something that we teach our young people, especially in children's church, to, to quote and to, to memorize. And certainly there is nothing wrong with that. As a matter of fact, there is nothing wrong and it's probably beneficial if we would pray this prayer every day. But in context of the scripture, what is happening is the disciples have saw something that is unique about Christ. The power that he had. The burden that he had to, to be closer to his father. And they believed that it was because of his prayer life. And they come to Jesus and they ask him, can you teach us to pray? And he gives them this prayer. And what's important about this is that we understand that this prayer is a model prayer. Right, right. 
It is an outline. It is not necessarily something that we must memorize, but it is a principle that's found in this prayer that is beneficial to us. They come to him and, and they wanted to learn to pray like him so they would have power like him, but they would have a burden like him. And Matthew here, and there's, on, there's another gospel that has this, and Matthew gives us this, uh, this model prayer, but it's very important that we understand this. As Jesus has given Matthew and the disciples these words, Matthew is not writing them down at that present time. He is writing them down years later after Christ has already ascended into heaven. And more than likely, he as he's writing this through the Holy Spirit leading him, he is thinking back and he's reading what other writers have written. And he was like, you know, this has been important to me. And this can be important to others as well. And I need to write this down. And as we have to over 2,000 years, this has been a model outline prayer that we can use in our life to become more in the image of Christ. So tonight I want to look at this and just get some really quick points about how that we can use some things out of this prayer to add to our prayer life that will help us and become more in His image and be more uh, fruitful in His work. The first thing I noticed when I studied this prayer is this prayer or a prayer life should be about resting. Look in verse 9, it says, after, the, uh, after this manner, therefore, pray ye our Father which art in heaven. Yeah. Those three words right there should give us hope and rest in our life. God is called our Father. What a precious truth this is for us tonight. The fact that we can be rooted and grounded in the fact that we know who our Father is. We are not praying tonight to an abstract object. We're not praying to a mystical being. We are praying to someone that has a desire to be called our Father. In Genesis 1.26, we learn that we are created in the image of God. He was our Father and the human race was His creation and He was our Father. But because of what in John 8, 44 teaches us, because of what Adam and Eve did, we then had a new father. But for those of us, according to John 3, 3 and John 7, that has been saved, we have now been brought back into the family and we now have a, new, a father again. And that should give us rest and hope tonight that we can pray to our father. Most ancient religions would not have understood this. And as a matter of fact, as Jesus is teaching his disciples that you start your prayer off in resting in the fact that you can pray to God, we have to keep this in mind. That the Jews had many different names for God. As a matter of fact, in, in Genesis twenty two fourteen, 14, that you find that they called him Jehovah Jireh. And that meant the Lord will provide. And, and when you needed God to provide something, you would call him your Jehovah Jireh. In Judges 6.24, you would find he was called Jehovah Shalom, which means that if you needed peace in your life, that is how you called him. Yeah. You, you had all you had Jehovah Raha in Psalms 23.1, which means he is your shepherd. And, and you can keep going and find different names that they would use for God. But in this prayer, this is what Matthew said. God is not interested in that now. He's interested in a personal relationship with you. And he wants you to call him Father. And we should have rest tonight in the fact that we know that who our Father is and that we can bring our prayers to Him. Since God is our Father, He carries us in His heart and He has our best interest in mind. My children here knows that I love them and they know that I have their best interest in their, heart, in their mind. And I don't ever want to give them anything that is harmful to them. And I also love them enough sometimes to say no. And that's what he's trying to get us. He's telling us, you understand the relationship, the human relationship. I want you to understand that is the same relationship that we have, that we can rest in the fact that we have a father. So not only did I see that, that there is a resting that must be in our prayer life, a confidence that we have someone to pray to that he loves us. 
But second of all, look with me here, keep going. It says this, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, and the earth is in heaven. Not only is there a resting in our prayer life, there should be some resigning in our prayer life. Thy will be done. There's a common phrase throughout this prayer. Listen to this, thy name, thy kingdom, and thy will. It is the fact that we are to resign to Him and that we are to do His will no matter how hard it is at times or difficult at times. Our heart should be in tune with Him. In other words, an essential part of a prayer life should be focusing on submitting to God. Yes, you can say these very words, but it is more important to have the heart of saying, God, whatever you want for me, that is what I'm going to do. And that's what we mentioned a minute ago. I, uh, I, I told you that, that when, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of people from Cane Ridge is watching tonight, and, and I've told them I had no intentions of pastoring the church, but we went over there and fell in love, and, 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 and that's what God wanted us to do. And those people saying, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm doing God's will. This is what God has told me to do. This is His will for my life. And, and that is something that we should pray, and it should be an essential part of our life, not only resting the fact that God loves us, but resigning to the fact that He has a will for us because He does love us. Notice that Matthew puts a unique spin on it. He says, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Just as the angels are submitting to God, we are to submit to God. And just as Christ submitted to God all the way to the cross, we must do the same. He's saying whatever the will is in heaven, whatever God wants in heaven is what you should want on earth. I am to pray that my own heart will be brought into perfect conformity to His revealed will. When I pray thy will be done on earth that is in heaven, I'm asking the Lord to take my life and conform it to His word and to His will. I'm yielding what I have in my life. I'm yielding everything that I have. And I am saying this right here. I'm putting in the hand of the one that can make me in his image. I am the clay and he's the pot. Listen, I am doing what he wants me to do. As a matter of fact, in Luke 22, 42, it says that Jesus is getting ready to go to the cross. And notice the words that he says, not my will, but thy will be done. Remember the disciples have come to Jesus and said, teach us to pray. And Jesus is going to model this out throughout every bit of it. Lord, if this cup can pass from me, let it pass from me. But if it's not, Lord, I am willing to do what you have to do. And that is why that he had power. That is why that he had a relationship with his father. Because he not only rested, but he was willing to resign to God's will. No matter what it was, he was willing to do. But notice here there is something else that is precious to us. It says here in verse 11, Give us this day our daily bread. Not only are we to rest and resign, but we can also request. Give us this day our daily bread. The entire first half of this prayer is focused solely on God. This prayer opens with an exclusive desire to bring honor and glory to His name. And then it is about being submitting to God. But now all of a sudden He is saying, you can also bring some requests to God. And some people would think that this is a selfish prayer. This is a selfish thing to do. In the scripture we're taught that we can pray for ourselves and others. On the surface, some would think this is being petty and narrow and selfish. And, and, and it is something that should not be bringing honor to God and glory to God. But I can tell you right now that when we bring our request to God, it is just as spiritual as resting and resigning in Him. For this is a truly part of our prayer that we have a, a part of our life is that when we bring request to God, we are bringing devotion, our devotion to Him. And understand this, it is a form of worship. In other words, when we rest and resign and, and we bring this to Him, we are telling Him that we are worshiping Him. And when we request things of Him, we are worshiping Him as well. 
When we bring our request to God, we are saying that we cannot handle this part of my life and I'm acknowledging that He is the only one that can do this. And remember that we've already resigned to His will. Therefore, we are saying we trust you and what you want to do in this situation. I read this this week or a couple weeks ago. It says, In reality, no higher form of worship exists than for a child of God to enter into the presence of his heavenly Father and unashamedly declare, I cannot make it without you. I'm totally dependent upon you. Our prayer life should not only be about resting and resigning, but it has to be about requesting. Something else about this requesting, notice here that it says, give us this day our daily bread. It is something that we are to do every day. We Listen, it doesn't mean that the scripture here teaches us it, that we can, we can bring our requests to God every day. I read this, it says this, yesterday as a canceled check, it's already been redeemed. Tomorrow is a promissory note, and it may never be paid. Today is cash in hand. Spend it wisely. Meaning this right here, that today is a day that I need God. Today is a day that I need His provisions. Today is a day that I need His protection. And aren't you glad tonight that we have a Heavenly Father that we can rest in and we can resign, but we can bring our request to Him because today is a day that He has created and He is God today and He is God tomorrow, but today is a day that we serve Him and we can bring these requests to Him. But not only do we rest in God, not only do we resign to God, not only request, but also our prayer is about releasing. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now this is the most difficult part of this prayer. Because when you get to this part of the prayer, you've got to be honest with God. Everything up to this point has been simple. When we pray this, we are admitting that we have a problem. Here is the problem that we have. In the scripture, it uses the word debts. To refer to our sin. This is one of five words that is used in the New Testament to describe our sin. We are admitting that we have a sin problem and it must be dealt with. When the Lord calls our sin a debt, He is reminding us that because that we are sinful, because that we are undone before Him, that sin has to be dealt with. And we can rest in God and resign to Him and bring a request. But understand, there must be a releasing of our sin debt. Having a debt means that an obligation must be met. I have an annoying thing that happens every month. Every month I make a house payment. And then the next month they send me another bill. According to First Bank in Nashville, Tennessee, in 2038, my house will be paid off. I have, a, I have to meet the obligation every week. I have a debt that must be paid. Do you know what will happen in 2038 when I pay that debt off? They're going to send me a deed to that property. And when they send me that deed to that property, this is what they're saying. Your debt has been fulfilled. In other words, the lien that is on that property is now released. And when we pray to God and we do what the scripture says and we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. In other words, he is saying, I'm listen to this, the lien against you because of your sin debt has been released. And just as we can have to pray and request daily, this is something that we must do daily, that we must confess to God that we need Him and that we're thankful for being releasing from our sin debt. But however, and I don't want to leave this point without something here, there is a condition. This condition is what makes it very hard. When we pray for God to release us of our sin debt... It is conditional on the fact that we extend forgiveness to others. 
When I refuse to maintain fellowship with other believers in the family of God, it affects my relationship with God the Father. Let me say that again. When I refuse to have a relationship with those in the family of God, it affects my relationship with others. Before I started pastoring the church in Tennessee, I got to travel a lot. And I'm going to be careful how I word this. I got to travel a lot for the college and preach. And a lot of times I would fly into a town and get there on Saturday and I'd get the rental car and I would drive and find the church. And there was one town I flew into, got the car, and I went to find the church and I saw a Free Will Baptist church here and I, and I got to the church about a mile and a half away and I'm like, that was weird, their church is that close to each other. And the next day I asked the pastor of the church, I said, I see there's a Free Will Baptist church. Oh yeah, but we don't associate with them. Uh, yeah. One of the churches had the word fellowship in it and one of the churches had the word unity in it. And I just found that was really odd that, that, you, that you, listen, a mile and a half away, you're saying that I, you can't even do, uh, fellowship with somebody, but yet you want God to forgive you of your prayers. Notice here with me about something real quick about this. It says this, forgive us our debt and, uh, and our day, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. There is a connection here. Before we can go to the next step, we have to understand that there is a releasing of our sin that must take place, but there is a condition here. But lastly tonight, not only is there resting, not only is there resigning and requesting and releasing, I'm glad that there's also rejoicing. Look with me in verse 13. It says, And lead us not into temptation, But deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. I don't know about you, but when I read that, I can rejoice in the fact that no no matter what the world is doing, it can be set on tearing itself apart and worried about this COVID-19 and all these other things. But I am glad tonight that I serve a God that his kingdom is going to be forever. And we need to rejoice in our prayer and resign to Him and request. But we must not forget that our prayer life must have rejoicing in it. So many times that we spend most of our time in the requesting part instead of the rejoicing part. But the rejoicing part is essential to this prayer. Notice here in verse 13 the last word of this prayer. Amen. We say amen on every prayer that we use. Most of the time we say it and we act as if it's meaning 10-4 or Roger or over and out. As if we're telling God goodbye. To understand this prayer, you have to understand what this word means. As a matter of fact, it is the last word in the Bible. It's Jesus' first words in John 151. Among the last words of the life of Jesus on the cross was the word Amen in Luke 23, 43. Amen is found in the Old Testament 25 times, 125 times in the New Testament. It is often translated as verily, verily. But what it actually means is so be it, or let it be, or I affirm this. And when Jesus told his disciples, this is how you pray. There is some things, and I, and I didn't even go through all the points here, but when you focus on just these five things, and at the very end you say, so be it. It means that you admitting, you are saying that this is true, and that you're going to rest in God. And you're going to resign to his will, and you're going to bring your request to him as an act of worship. And you're going to ask releasing of your sin debt. And you're going to rejoice. And you're going to step back and say, it is true. It is over. It is finished. Please understand this, that Matthew, as I said earlier, he is writing this years later. And I found it interesting as I studied this and prayed about this passage These disciples, when they go to Jesus and they ask him to pray, they had no idea what was laying ahead of them. Christ did. 
He knew that most of all these men were going to face a martyr's death. He knew that most, if not all, of these men were going to be sent across the globe preaching the gospel. He knew the life that they was going to have. He knew, watch this, he knew that people were going to wrong them and hurt them and that they was going to have to have a time in their life that they prayed for forgiveness of those people. They knew there was going to be times in their life where they did not feel like resting in God. He knew that there was going to be times in their life that they can hardly even pray I bring a prayer of requesting to God. And he knew there was going to be times in their life that it was going to be hard to rejoice. But this is what he said. Practice this prayer. Model this prayer. Because this prayer is what's going to make a difference in your life. Let me close with this statement. Samuel Chadwick said this. The one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from a prayerless studies, prayerless works... And prayerless religions. He laughs at our toil and mocks at our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. I was sitting as Jeff and Stephanie was singing, and there was only four four or five of us in here, so I didn't want to get too crazy or happy. But I couldn't just help to thinking the very words of every song that was sung here today went right to this, that I can pray to God and He cares about me. And there could be people watching right now and you feel lonely and hurt and and confused. Pray because He loves you and He has the best in mind for you. Father, we love you. We thank you for everything. We ask you, Father, that you be with this time and that you work in our lives. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. As heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Maybe you're here tonight and as Brother Greg spoke, uh, the Holy Spirit just spoke to your heart. You you have a request tonight. You have some prayer requests that you need God to answer. Maybe you've prayed for for years over a a certain request and the devil would love for you to give up. Uh, But maybe you're, you're just right there. You're so close. Uh, but you have a need in your life. You have something that, that, that is burdening you, a request that you're asking God for. And you want to ask that tonight. His heads are bowed, eyes are closed. And you're asking tonight, God, I have a need tonight. I have a burden tonight. I have a, a prayer request, a loved one on my yes, heart God, that yeah. needs the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, Whomever yes. it may be tonight, you just, in your room, you just slip up your hand by that saying, pray for me. God knows what it is. God knows the need, knows the burden, knows the person. But remember me tonight. Would you just slip up your hand? Maybe you have loved ones who are are lost. They're away from the Lord. You want to lift them up tonight. You just lift up your hand. I say, pray for my loved ones. Pray for my my spouse, my kids, my my friends, whomever it may be. God, we love you. We thank you for the words tonight. Thank you for the message from Brother Greg. For those who are watching, God, surely there are, are many who have needs in their life. Others who have requests that they've been asking you, God, day after day, year after year. God, I pray that they would continue lifting up those prayers to you. Lord, there are so many who have loved ones who are lost and need you. God, I pray tonight we would lift them up as well in prayer. We love you. We thank you. Have your way in every heart and life. For it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand together? Would you sing with us as we close? Sing this old song. I will serve thee. Why? Because I love thee.
Brother Greg, a hand at home. We appreciate the message. Tremendous job. He always does a great job. And we appreciate him coming, sharing with our church family tonight. I want to remind you again, next week we go back to like it was the first week uh, at 9.30 a.m. Uh, we'll be having those, the last name between the letter A and the letter L coming to church. And those at 11.15 coming uh, with the last name from letter M to letter Z. And uh, we hope you come to that. We have had several. Uh, we were going to have a baptismal service the first Sunday in May. And, of course, all of this uh, pandemic outbreak took place. And so we had to postpone that. We're looking to do that at the end of July, uh, beginning of August around then. So if you have um, someone who, who wants to uh, follow in biblical baptism, they've been saved, I need to speak with them, let them uh, come talk with me, and we'll uh, get their name down. But there are several who want to do that, several who are on the list in May as well. So I'll be getting that out uh, shortly on the exact date. That'll be later in, in July. Any other announcements? It's Father's Day Sunday. Father's Day is Sunday. Let me do say this. We usually have a father-son banquet. Uh, on Saturday, the Saturday before that because of everything going on. We're postponing that as well, probably to the end of July. We're still going to do it because we really have a great time with that, our father-son banquet. So that's still going to be uh, taking place, but it'll be sometime in July, but we'll give you a date on that as well. Also, remember, Roger, I think perhaps he may get to come home today. So pray for Rog. My cousin David Graham has a PET scan tomorrow. There's a remote chance that they'll get to go home to Mississippi this this the end of this week. So pray to that end that God would, we want God's will, as Greg said, first and foremost. And then remember Sister Ann Shelton, a sweet, sweet friend that loves the Lord. And remember Sister Ann. She's Amen. in need of prayer. And don't forget Bruce Harvey as well. Bruce Harvey Amen. needs our Thank prayers. You. And let's remember Brother Bruce in our prayers as well. We love you. Good to see you. Well, didn't see you, but good to, good to associate with you tonight. Make sure you reach out to Brother Greg. Tell him what a great job he did. And we'll see you on Wednesday night to continue our study in the book of Revelation. God bless.